our guest today, uh, Gary Kay, president, CEO, founder of, of Rave Publications. Uh, and really, as, as I kind of said in the introduction, I'm, I'm not sure there's anyone better to, to sum up a trade show uh, than the guy who's crazy enough to, to try and take a video of every single booth at a trade show. So Gary, welcome. <laughs> hey, Justin, how are you? I'm, I'm doing very well. Uh, so, so how was it? You're, you're back? Are your arms tired? Uh, how, was, how, how was the trip? <laughs> How was the first trade show and the uh, first big trade show in two years? I was so excited to be there with, a, I don't know, five or six, 7,000, including exhibitors, other people. They haven't announced official numbers, but there's no question it beat my expectations. Um, I, I think that uh, as long as you had realistic expectations that it was going to be a small show, uh, as Matt said, it was more intimate. Um, I can imagine how some people who didn't go might have a little bit of FOMO because it was a unique uh, kind of different opportunity because you actually got to spend a lot of time with people. Like I, you know, I saw uh, the Netgear team, uh, John, for example, from Netgear five or six times. And every time we had a conversation and before I, you know, I'm rushing from booth to booth and don't have much time for conversations. And, and it was, it, what it, what it showed me is that the power of trade shows is the networking side of things and the people stuff. So I think what's going to mm -hmm. happen in the future is you're going to see less product being shown and focused on at trade shows and more people stuff being focused on at trade shows in the future. So, well, that gets to something I, I wanted to explore, which is what do you think are the lessons that people will take from this Infocom? That, that they're going to apply to to future shows. How how is the how is the modern AV trade show going to change as a result of what people saw at this Infocom? Well, the shows like ISE and and uh, Avix's Infocom show and and other shows like that are, are going to they're not going to die. Like people think that shows are going to die. They're not going to die that quickly, and they're not going to die. At, some of the shows like big ones like these aren't going to die. But what I think will happen is that um, brands will come up with different ways to use that presence. I don't think uh, most manufacturers are going to gear product launches around trade shows anymore. There was already a move away from that over the last five or six years, but certainly over the pandemic, it, it became a lot easier for brands to launch product. There were so many online uh, events, uh, webinars, um, they built their digital audiences and the relationship with their di di trust, I should say, the trust with the digital audience. They did a better job building it over the last um, over the last year and a half because a lot of brands, they had a website, but that's it. And it was more static. Now they all had to add yeah. webinar functionality. And I think, so I think what's going to happen is that they're going to utilize that for product introductions and then wait for trade shows to build better relationships and still show product there, but not as many as before. Isn't that almost uh, sort of sort of all you know? What's what's old is new again. Isn't that what trade shows for us were twenty five years ago when it was, you know, taking orders on the show floor and and really moving product? I'm not saying we're going all the way there necessarily, but but that was fundamentally more about networking and meeting people than about new product launches. Are we? Is this just another cycle of life? Well, I will say from my own experience, I'll give you a personal experience. When I was at Extron and I first started there, so my first trade show at Extron, we were a little small company surrounded by big brands, companies like Sharp and Barco and Sony that were there at the show, big broadcast brands like Panasonic and Ross. And, and, uh, and we had a very small booth and it was very difficult for us to get any attention, which is the whole reason why I started the program where we go to trade shows, Rave does, goes to trade shows and shoots videos at every single booth. Because I remember how it felt to okay. spend a lot of time and effort fixing up a booth and having barely anyone go to the booth. Because it was, the show was so busy that people just didn't have time to notice us or even care about us, even though we wanted them to care about us. And this, this is Extron. This is a brand that now is like the leading, you know, one of the leading brands in the industry, right? So, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, that, that show didn't help us. What, what happened was once, once I came up with the concept of coming out with shooting videos at every single booth, it equalized the playing field so that small exhibitors who 
you know, there's 240,000 people in our industry, only best year possible, 45,000 went to Infocom, which means that over about 200,000 didn't even go to the show, but then they'd come back and look at our coverage and everybody's box and squares for their videos was exactly the same size. It equalized everyone. Mm -hmm. So you could discover new products. And I think that's the, the reason why shows will continue to exist because there's going to be a need for brands to still be discovered. And I think if there's less products and more people and more networking and more relationships and events and things like that, then that's going to give those smaller companies an easier ability to be discovered. So I, I, I feel like we've kind of touched on the answer to this, but I want to, to give a shout out again to, to Georgia. Thank you for writing in your question. Uh, she said, of course, you know, it seems like the show was much smaller in attendance this year, but was that necessarily a bad thing? I mean, we all knew it was going to be smaller. I mean, uh, with the pandemic, there was just tons of people that just said they didn't want to go. I mean, I want to say tons, thousands. Um, so instead of 45,000 people, including exhibitors, depending on how they count it, I don't know if they're going to count. I went yeah. to the show three days. Are they going to count me as three or are they going to count me as one? Because every show is different how they count things. But if they count me as just one for the three days, I think that we'll have something like 7,000 people that went to the show. And then you have the exhibitors too. So, you know, including the exhibitors is maybe another mm -hmm. 1,500, 2,000 people. So definitely it was a lot smaller, but I don't think you'll talk to anyone who went to the show who will say they were, they were disappointed in going to the show. Now, I definitely yeah. think you'll talk to people who are happy they didn't go to the show because of the risks and the reward uh, trade-off. Because there was, you know, there wasn't a lot, like, it, it's not like you, you could do that whole show in a day. It's not like there was a whole bunch of amazing technology we'd never seen before, like there is a, often at shows, because a lot of it had already been introduced and, and virtually no one has a cycle to introduce products in October. So when Infocom got moved from June to October, it meant that what we were going to see is stuff that was already introduced. But people like Crestron, the biggest booth on the show floor, they didn't have any products, not a single product in their booth. They had a sign promoting their road show, right? But Aurora, who was right at the front of the hall, they surrounded the product. They had an L-shaped booth where they had, I don't know, at least 10 different products in the booth and they, they made it like a regular uh, they made it like a regular show. So depending on what mm -hmm. you were doing, uh, you got out of something out of the show. Uh, so it's not like, like, I think the people who didn't go are happy. They didn't go. The people who did go are happy. They went. So I think everyone is satisfied. And I think Avixa did a pretty good job pulling it off. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I kind of wish I'd seen it is the honest truth. Um, let me drag us you can. back to, if you go to, to... raypubs.com, you can, if you go to <laughs> raypubs.com slash, Infocom 2021, all 420 some videos that we shot are right there. And you can literally play through them all uh, and watch every single new product video. I mean, literally, that's what we do. And that's it's amazing. You don't you, have to do anything to get them. You've got to have a ton of people cranking away all weekend at that. Um, we did. Let we me, had people let me drag over us, the weekend. <laughs> let me drag us back to, to, to where I need to take the show, which is uh, let's talk about signal distribution specifically. Now, maybe your answer is, is, is what you've talked about, that the product wasn't the focus, but did you see any any important new trends in the in the signal distribution area, right? Where where we here in SDVOE play, and uh, you know, is AV over IP uh, trending trending the same way it has? Is there any changes? You know, what's what's going on with the technology for distribution these days? What did Infocom show you? Well, the 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 probably the number one thing that's going to accelerate AV over IP in twenty twenty two is going to be NDI. The fact that NDI is being adopted by so many brands is going to actually accelerate um, AV over IP. So I think you'll see a lot of NDI in SDVOE products for control and management. Um, and I think that will accelerate um, the adoption rate of AV over IP. It was already there. It depends on the segment. If you're in the edu higher education, AV over IP was the way to go. Like it, there's nobody in higher education building systems the old fashioned way if they don't have to. Um, and then, you know, if they're just fixing a room that already exists, okay. But if they're building a new rooms, they're all putting them in AV over IP. Corporate is going to be slower because still no one knows how many people are going to go back to the office. UCC is already networked. So, so taking that outside the UCC room, like the meeting room, into other spaces, the best way to do that is AV over IP. So I think if you're not doing AV over IP, you know, kudos to you and your team because your, AV, your SDVOE Academy is a great learning source. Uh, and I don't know, definitely more than half of those classes don't even mention 
SDVOE. So if you're right. concerned about taking that class and, and feeling like you're just going to get a sales pitch, you're not. Uh, I, I have to give you hats off for that because you, you actually put together a really good program there. So I think that there's an easy way for you to kind of drop in. But, but at the same time, we're going to have parallel systems, right? You're going to have the IPMX, you're going to have Crestron, Extron, yeah. and then you're going to have SDVOE all running in parallel. And depending on who you're aligned with is who you're going to put in. Okay. Well, of course, we want everyone to align with SDVOE, but, uh, but that's a topic for another show. <laughs> uh, do you think that, that with some of the trends you mentioned, is, is AV over IP finally heading towards a majority? I, I think the, the consensus that, that I've seen and that I believe is that still today, the matrix switch is, is the bulk of ports that are shipping into, into designs that are getting installed. Do you, see the, do you see that changing in 2022 as a result of some of these trends? It won't be more than 50%, but you're moving that direction. I mean, you're probably going to, mm -hmm. you're going to probably tip to 30%, which is a significant uh, tipping point for the industry. And then availability is going to be an issue. So I think if products are available and there's plenty of availability out there and, and the shipping constraints and supply constraints and chip constraints don't become an issue, 2020 year will be a huge year for AV over IP. If those become an issue, then it'll be 2024. So I think that if, 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 it, you know, Aurora said, uh, we got tons of product in stock. Don't worry about it. We're not going to have any problems. If that's true for everybody, then you're okay. If, if, mm -hmm. the, if the, the big inhibiting factor isn't going to be technology adoption, it's going to be availability. That's uh, interesting that you bring that up. We've got a show scheduled in a, in a few weeks to, to talk about the supply chain with, uh, with Mark Coxon. Um, but I think that's kind of a wild card in all this, honestly. It's, it's going to depend on what products, what chips aren't available. Right? It could be that what you need right. for a matrix switch isn't available and suddenly AV over IP is the only game in town. Or it could go the other way, that the pieces you need for AV over IP aren't there and, and a matrix switch is what you have to stick with. Um, I know well, one the of nice the... thing about AV over IP is you have a lot less gear in a system. So you're yeah. probably going to benefit from the chip shortage because you're taking a product that may have had, you know, a system that may have had, you know, 60 core chips in it for a typical, uh, you know, large lecture hall kind of environment or, uh, you know, a, a heavy duty meeting room environment is going to have 20 or 30 chips and you're bringing it down to six or seven. So it could benefit from that, but I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I will tell you that a lot of big brands yeah. told me they're going to have major supply problems the first quarter of next year, a lot. It's yeah, no, that, that's, that's something that's really coming, coming for us all. Not, not only professionally, but even even personally, you know, it's it's a yeah. I told all my strange... friends back in April, if you're in the market for a TV during the holidays, you need to buy it now because you're going to pay twice as much. And TV prices have gone up fifty percent since then. Wow, wow, I haven't uh, I hadn't noticed that. I do have a closet full of uh, Legos that I pretend uh, are are in case there's a supply chain issue for my kids for Christmas. Of course, my kids are are four and five years old, and and these are like adult Lego sets. But I pretend it's for them, uh, so that helps. The me. greatest, by yeah, the way, you yeah. bring up Legos. The greatest ad for Legos ever is a headline that says. Legos destroying parents' feet since 1946 or something like that. I mean, like it's it's <laughs> it's the greatest to add because that's exactly how I think of a Lego is stepping on it in the middle of the. I'm night. with you, actually. My my four year old for the first time got it himself the other day. He stepped on one, and and I mean, okay, I love my son. I don't want to see him cry, but you know, there was a moment of yeah. You see, you see what I've been dealing with, punk. Uh, he's okay. He's okay, folks. Don't worry. He's just fine. Uh, Gary, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you for the partnership and, and for featuring us on Replay Week we're, today again. Hello, we're very to excited to have you. Launch. Not just part of Replay Week. We're very excited to have you part of Launch. The whole season is going to be inside of Launch. We're, we're excited to be part of it and uh, we're proud to, to have been picked. And SDVOE, you know, the Academy, I hope you're going to push that because that's a big deal. We are. Check those links below. You'll be in the Academy in no time. Gary, we'll say goodbye for now and we'll take the audience to a quick fact check.